One of the things you might be surprised by is the fact that there's actually a professor who was made a saint. He's also one of the largest saints in terms of girth. You know, he's a little, he's a professor, he overeat. I mean, that's by definition, professors overeat. Uh, <laughs> wrap steps away from the, that's why I'm standing so far away from the podium. Uh, but uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And so uh, usually before I do any type of presentation, I always uh, open with the prayer because I'm not very good at spontaneous prayers. I've never been very good at spontaneous prayers. Uh, so uh, this is uh, sometimes called the uh, Aquinas prayer. I know uh, at the Catholic Student Center, we regularly, at least in the past, had been doing it, had been praying it right before like final exam week and stuff like that. So uh, why don't we uh, start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, lofty origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your brilliance penetrate into the darkness of my understanding and take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, an obscurity of both sin and ignorance. Give me a sharp sense of understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in completion. Through Christ our Lord, amen. That mic's gonna get in the way. Uh, good morning. Uh, in case you don't know who I am, I wore my name tag. So, uh, I did put it right, so yes I did. Uh, <laughs> the last couple of times I put it on so only I can read it. I don't know why. It's like when you're driving and you see ambulance spelled out correctly behind you, you know you probably ought to scooch over a little bit. Uh, particularly, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, learned that the hard, hard way one time on my bike, but that's... Uh, <laughs> so. They got the dents out of the front of the ambulance pretty quickly. So, oh. <clears throat> surprisingly, I'm one of the, one of the deacons here. That that's always surprises me, too, every morning when I wake up. But, uh, there's a couple years ago, I was walking across campus and someone you know, kept yelling deacon and I kept looking for one and I couldn't find him. I guess they were yelling at me. So uh, <laughs> I've been asked to talk uh, today, and that's really loud, i uh, been asked to talk today a little bit about church history. Now I will let you know right now, it is impossible to talk about uh, church history in 45, 50 minutes, uh, impossible. Uh, so I'm not even gonna try. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about what I wanna talk about and uh, one of the things you'll, you should see is I, in the, that stack of paper, one of them's called additional resources. Additional resources, something like that? Oh, I actually have it. Uh, additional resources. I should probably explain to you the stuff that we have. Uh, but the additional resources, one of them is a, a church history additional resources. And I think all of the books listed on here are actually available at the WT Library. So if you wanted to take a look at one, you should be able to find it over at the WT Library. I think they're all there. Because there's a couple of books that I would have probably put on this list. Uh, my wife, who is a librarian, uh, created the list. So, and, and yes and no, it could be uh, books at the WT Library or not. But one of those books is by Thomas S. Bockencotter. And you'll notice the title. The title of the book is A Concise History of the Catholic Church. Now, if you were writing a concise history, about how long would it be? 190, 200 pages maybe? This one is a little over 800. So if I mentioned that it's hard to teach about church history in 50 minutes, he doesn't even do the whole thing. It's only concise. He boils it down to 800 pages. So uh, uh, that's, that's interesting. Before we get uh, too far gone here, uh, there's a couple of announcements and I'm hoping I understood Adrian correctly. Uh, if not, he'll correct me. There is no class next week, which is the 14th. I guess you can't have RCI because of Valentine's Day. It's a four day weekend. Yeah, I, gotcha. Uh, well, it's a four day weekend for the public schools, K through 12. Not for the higher ed folks, everything above 12. Uh, those of us like us, uh, well, I teach 24 seven anyway. Uh, last night I got up at three and I sent an email to my students I can't wait to see all the comments I get back. Dr. Roush, what are you doing up at three o'clock? It's like, you only rent water. Uh, 
There is a class, however, on the 21st. Now, the 21st is going to be a busy day because uh, it is the right of sending and the right of election. Yes. Well, he's been going back and forth on that. Uh, one, one hour, he's one thing. He's, he's like a, a, a university administrator. He changes his mind every two or three minutes and then complains at you if you don't follow the directions because you didn't know what the directions were at the time. I, I've been a college professor for 26 years, 27 years, and so I learned that I never pay attention to what administrators say anyway. So I'm never lost, or I'm always lost. Uh, either way, it's an even keel, even buzz, so I'm good to go. Uh, but yeah, so he did say that there's going to be class. It's not going to be class class. It's going to be more uh, father's question and answer type of thing. Because you, you have to be here with your sponsor at 8.30 for the rite of sending at the 9 o'clock mass. Note to self, volunteer for fr uh, Saturday at 5. Uh, <laughs> which is probably, I haven't been, have I been 9 o'clock on Sunday in a long time? I haven't, because then last week Gabe was all the masses. So that would be, uh, and, and Adrian will be sending you an email probably this afternoon with all of this. Uh, and then there's class, and then I think it's at 1 o'clock or so you have to be up. 1.30, up at St. Mary's, the cathedral, uh, off of Washington. I always find the easy thing to do is go to Washington and just take the whole thing. Uh, it's very scenic. Uh, you don't get stuck on the interstate back when they were still doing all that construction. Except the, the one time for the chrism mass, I left two hours in advance. I was going to get there. I was going to get there on time. So I go up the interstate. We're stuck there. So I turn off, and I'm winding my way through the countryside, looking at Randall County, you know, waving at it as I go by. And I, I get there 10 minutes before the chrism mass. So again, note to self, leave early, you know, get a snack. Uh, so. The thing that the one at St. Mary's, that's just for the catechists that are going to be baptized, right? That, that, that would be for everyone. It's just uh, certain people sign a book, certain people do not. Okay. And if I read, did I mention I don't really read a lot of administrative stuff? So even okay. stuff that comes from Adrian, I don't always read. Uh, Let me start out with the, overf the overflow. Let me start out with the overview. So you picked up all the stuff over there. You should have gotten a thing called church history, a timeline. Uh, just disregard some of the typos in it. Uh, you should have gotten a, another sheet that says church history, additional resources. Uh, and I have those broken down, or we have those broken down into two parts, history of the Roman Catholic Church, and then history of the Catholic Church in the United States, both of which are interesting reads. Uh, if you had to read only one thing on there, I would probably go with the Bokenkater, and then uh, down in the history of uh, in the United States, Jay Dolan's pretty good, although it's only up to 85, uh, and I have no idea what 20080 is. I think I, was <laughs> I got a little exuberant with my zeros for the James O'Toole, uh, so <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, in order to publish at Bell Cap, your name has to start with an O, so O'Malley and uh, O'Toole. What else is over there? There's also a printout. I think there should be a printout. There's a couple handouts from your regular handouts. There should be a printout from the Popes in a Year. Uh, there are two ways that I have found to access church history. Church history is long. It's about 2,000 years, a little over 2,000 years. There's a lot happening in about 2,000 years. Uh, there's ups and downs. You know, sometimes things happen, sometimes things don't. But there's two ways to access it. The first one is to track the biographies of the Popes. So that's one way you can look at it. Because the popes are continuing, so throughout history, every pope had to do something in his church, even the ones that only were pope for like two weeks or three weeks. They still did something. Sometimes it was they were elected pope, and then they died. Uh, I mean, it'd be a shock. In many cases, those were martyred popes, actually. Uh, so that's one way. There is a, a, a flock note. You're all familiar with flock notes now, hopefully. Those have, you know, we, well, flock note does a pope in a year. They also do the catechism in a year as well. So you might want to check those out. But the Pope in a year, I find very interesting and informative. I have been doing it now, I think, for three years, four years. And they get the people to write different, different authors write each year. Uh, in fact, I think different authors write each month. So uh, they change over time. So it's not like you're reading about the same thing every time about the same Pope. Uh, some things jump out at you. Uh, my personal favorite is what else was going on in the world at the time. You know, the Chinese invented, you know, found gunpowder, that type of stuff. 
Uh, the second way of getting into the church history is the church councils. There are 21 church councils. The first one is mentioned, actually about five or six, maybe seven of them are mentioned. They should all be mentioned on here. I wonder if not all mentioned on here. Uh, but it should, should be mentioned on here. Uh, there are 21 starting with Jerusalem. The, that's uh, outlined in the Acts of the Apostles. Yes. Uh, and then ending with Vatican II, of course. Uh, <laughs> I had a person ask me one time, uh, so is Vatican II, whatever happened to Vatican I? And it's like, well, it never ended. Uh, so you might recall, that's when, uh, if you know your Italian history, we all know our Italian history. Uh, in 1870, of course, Garibaldi and his buddies all wearing red and stuff. And actually some American uh, Civil War soldiers joined up. They were Italian, so they went back to Italy after the Civil War, and they fought to unify Italy. Uh, Italy is a relatively new country, 1870. Germany is a relatively new country as well, 1870. That's how I know my Italian history because I took a lot of classes on German and Italian history. Uh, the food was really good, kind of heavy at times, but pretty good. So the church councils, why look at the church councils? Well, the church councils, first of all, there's something that caused each church council. Some sort of debate going on in the church or outside of the church that caused the church to want to have a council. So that gives you a good sense of history, overall history. But you can also, uh, how, did the, how was the church different after the council? So instead of having to read all 2,000 some years, you only have to read about 21 individual things. Uh, and there's a good book I listed on here, The General Councils, a history of the 21 general councils. Uh, it's interesting, they list Nicaea to Vatican II. Uh, they don't really count Jerusalem as one of those. but. Uh, I wonder what came out of the Nicene, or the Nicene Council. Oh, some sort of creed or something. Uh, very clever. So, but yeah, I encourage you to take a look at some of those books. Uh, look up the names. Uh, Raymond F. Brown is a uh, actually is a is a priest, uh, a priest theologian historian. Uh, so his books tend to be a little bit more priest like, historian like, theologian like uh, type of thing. Okay, uh, and then uh, Adrian did tell me to mention indulgences, so if you would indulge me. Uh, I'll be here all week. Uh, don't forget to tip your weight staff. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, let's start in the beginning, shall we? In the beginning. In this case, it's C circa 33 AD. <laughs> you thought I was gonna go back further than that. Uh, uh, what's interesting, and if you've ever taken a history class, uh, secular historians like to do the BCE, before the Common Era, which cleverly enough is followed by <clears throat> the Common Era, uh, the CE, so BCE. Uh, but I'm just going to use the traditional, uh, less secular way of referring to AD, uh, Annus Domini. Uh, Pentecost, 33 AD, the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary, the apostles, and about 120 disciples. 3,000 joined the church on that day. That's a heck of a lot of people, 3,000. Uh, historians and, and archeological type folks, uh, histor historians kind of think that if there was 3,000 that joined the church on that day, there had to have been close to 200,000 people in the area at the time. Well, they don't think that. Uh, so 3,000 is just one of those, you pick a number, put it in, uh, and here's where Roush becomes heretical. Uh, He's contradicting the Bible. All you really need to know is a lot of people joined the church that day. 3,000 is a good number. It's probably not a realistic number based on how many people were actually there for Pentecost. Pentecost, of course, is a Jewish festival. Uh, and so uh, all these folks were there. Uh, you might remember that uh, Mary and the apostles were in the upper room uh, for fear of the Jews. There were a lot of Jews in town that day. Uh, and I guess, I mean, I can read out loud. You all can read too, but just a couple of high points here. Uh, the first evangelist. Now we think of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as being the evangelists. But a real evangelist, the person who actually went around and essentially sold Christianity, that's the only thing you see on the video, but you can't hear on the audio, is my fingers, uh, unless I'm really arthritic today, but I'm not. I'm actually pretty, pretty limber today. Uh, he actually sold. He went around to different parts of the empire and essentially sold Christianity. Uh, it is uh, 
thought that he fell off a horse, but he didn't. There was no horse, uh, of course, of course. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, I mean, it's interesting. And he's pretty good, actually, at selling Christianity because it uh, essentially, uh, Christianity started out as a small group of, of Jewish folks uh, who follow Christ to a world religion. Uh, our first church council meets by 50 AD and decides that Gentiles can become Christian without becoming Jewish first. Now, no, for the females among us, not such a big deal. If you're a 33-year-old, let's say you're a 33, 40-year-old male, in order to become Jewish first, you would have had to have what? Owie. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that was determined. But it, there was also a, a strong question and, and a rather controversial question about what you could eat. Of course, we all know that Jews have dietary laws, um, you know, various meats you can't eat, different things. You can't put your cheese on top of your hamburger. Can you imagine McDonald's if we were all Jewish? Uh, there would be no cheeseburgers. Uh, and bacon cheeseburgers would be right out. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as kosher pork. Uh, the, the concern, though, however, was not so much the Jewish dietary laws, although those were important. That's where the Jewish part comes in. Uh, but it was also sometimes people would, uh, uh, the pagans would have uh, ceremonies where they would roast an ox and sacrifice that to the gods. But that seems like a lot of wasted meat. Anyway, you have good barbecue sitting there. Uh, I don't know what sauce they used. Uh, I always wonder, you know, they like sweet baby rays or something on your, <laughs> on, your pagan, on your pagan barbecue. You might remember that there's that passage from the Bible that says it's not what goes in that defiles, it, what, it's what comes out. Uh, and so that's where the, that Jewish council, or that first church council, uh, it was made up largely of the bishops, in this case it was the apostles, uh, that were gathered together with uh, Paul and some of his uh, compadres uh, uh, as missionaries. By 70 AD, uh, there was a fascinating thing I saw on YouTube that talks about the Jewish diaspora that's a $300 word. Does anyone have $300? Like to give me? Uh, diaspora. Why, why did the Jews leave Jerusalem? Well, they were essentially kicked out or killed by the Romans in 70 AD. Uh, you might have heard of the Wailing Wall. Well, that's t part of the temple that's left over after it was destroyed by the Jews, pardon me, destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Uh, and at that point then, uh, Jews just dis dispersed. They moved all over the parts of the empire, you know, Gaul, uh, what became Spain, North Africa, uh, some into, into the European areas. Rome was a big one. Uh, and uh, there's a fascinating YouTube video that talks about Jewish history, essentially all of Jewish history in like 16 minutes. Uh, so if, I, if they can do Jewish history in 16 minutes, I can do church history in, in 45. Uh, since I killed about 35 with the lead-in. Uh, <laughs> what else do we have? Well, uh, in the early church history, one of the things we, we talk a lot about are persecutions. Uh, and of course, we have a bunch of Roman emperors, Nero, Domitian, uh, Decius, and Diocletian persecute the young church. So what, what's interesting about these persecutions is a lot of folks will have this picture of the persecutions being like that whole time frame. I have it listed as 50 AD, to uh, 313, but it really wasn't. There was like persecution, then sometimes with not persecution. Then there was persecution. Most persecutions were actually local. So you might have, you know, pagans in Alexandria beating up Christians in Alexandria, uh, Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, and then you might move to Antioch. You pick one, there's many Antiochs. Uh, so most persecutions were local persecutions. It was a rare persecution that became an, an, an empire-wide persecution. But these are the big ones, Nero's, Domitian's, uh, Decius. One of the things that would happen during persecutions, of course, and this is where I gave you, I'm hoping I gave you the right, I wanna say it's not Fabian, it's the Pope after Fabian. That was his name too, Saint Pope after Fabian. Uh, no, actually, which one comes first? Uh, Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius is the successor of Saint Fabian. Cornelius uh, had an interesting issue because he was the Pope, not too long, uh, when Fabian died, Fabian was martyred by Decius. 
I'm mispronouncing that amazingly well. But, uh, and so Fabian, who's a pope, was martyred. It took him a number of years, at least a year, to pick a new pope because the, uh, I'll just read what it says here. The emperor Decius' ridiculous obsession with snuffing out the church prevented a new pope from being elected for about a year, uh, apparently even saying he'd prefer a rival emperor to a new bishop of Rome. Well, if you're the emperor, one of the things you don't want to do is say, hey, I'd rather have a rival emperor. So he got a rival emperor. So when he dashed off to the east to beat up this rival emperor, the Catholics, the Christians in Rome picked a new pope, uh, Pope St. Saint Cor Cornelius. Uh, and Cornelius is interesting because he had a deal. Let's say that you're Christian and you don't want to get persecuted, so you don't want to get killed. So you decide you're going to, like, I'm, I'm not Christian. No, I don't, I don't believe in that. And then you sort of do your sacrifice to the, to the emperor, to the, to the other gods. Now all of a sudden you have a new pope and the pope says, well, if you come back to the church, we'll let you back in. Uh, do you have to be rebaptized? Hmm. Uh, that's very interesting. Some, some uh, Christians at the time said you did. That would be a heresy, by the way. Some Christians said that you did. And uh, St. Cornelius, Pope St. Cornelius, had to fight that heresy. Uh, and so it, it's interesting because you might remember if you've already been baptized, like when I joined, I, I'm actually a, a convert. I joined the church in 2004. I was baptized in the Lutheran Church, uh, uh, ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, although it wasn't known as that back in 1967 when I was baptized. Uh, I was actually baptized on tax day. Uh, and my mom has said I've been taxing the whole time since. Uh, so uh, uh, I was baptized on April 15th. I was a whole month old. I don't remember much about that. Uh, I was actually baptized by a relative of mine. So, uh, I had a point. Oh, I did, when I joined the church, I did not have to be rebaptized. Uh, so really the only people that have to be baptized when you join the Catholic Church are people who haven't been baptized before. Kind of makes sense. And uh, people who are baptized but not in a Trinitarian form. Uh, the Trinitarian form, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Unless you use a hose, at which point it's in the squid. Uh, son, you, we don't use a hose usually. Although there are some churches, uh, because of COVID, have been baptizing using super soakers. Uh, <laughs> the water's got to be moving. It's got to be clean water. And you got to do it three times. It doesn't say how. So the super soaker actually does work. Uh, theologically, well, theologically, canonically, it, does, it is appropriate. I, I wouldn't myself because I have really horrible aim. Uh, and I would end up hitting myself. I would end up hitting my wife who was sitting like out in the congregation. I'm sure they have like plastic put down when they do. So. Okay. Uh, by the way, all of this stuff that's in this little outline is also in your handout that you have, the one, the official one that you're given. Uh, I noticed, kind of clever. There's really only, <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. There's just one history. So it's not hard to include both uh, in both places. Uh, what's interesting is in 96, we're already up to 96. Uh, we're going to crest 100 here in a minute. Uh, we're at 96. Clement. Uh, there's a, a, a letter called the Clementine letter. And I was talking about the Clementine letter, and this little kid kept asking me about those little oranges. Why, why did the little oranges write a letter? Uh, and I said, no, they put it on orange paper. Uh, that's why it's called the Clementine letter. No, it was written by Clement, who was the Bishop of Rome. And the reason we know the Bishop of Rome is in charge of the whole church is based on that letter. Because uh, he wrote to the Corinthian church. At this time, the Corinthian church, Corinth. Corinth is fascinating. If you ever get a chance, study Corinthian his history. Corinth is on a peninsula, not peninsula, an isthmus. <laughs> it's on a narrow strip of land that's in, you know, and what would happen is uh, seafaring folks would pull up to the port and then in some cases they would actually drag their boat across the thin strip of land to the other side and put their boat back in. But because it was a seafaring area, it had a lot of different people. Uh, seafaring people attract, or seafaring areas attract a lot of different people. So you'd have people from all over the world, Indians, in South Asian Indians. Uh, I doubt there were very many Native American Indians uh, in, <laughs> in Corinth in 96. Uh, <laughs> doubt it. Could be, not 
not going to say it wasn't, but, uh, but of course you had the, the church there, and, and the church there, one of the things the church did, uh, they had a bishop who told them they had to do stuff. They had to follow the rules. Well, what do you do when someone tells you you have to follow the rules and you don't want to follow the rules? You get rid of the dude. So they canned their bishop. Well, Pope Clement, uh, the Bishop of Rome, wrote a letter to the Corinthians saying, you can't do that. You do not have the power to get rid of your bishop. Uh, and that was just an indicative of the fact that he was over the whole church. He wasn't just over the, you know, he's a bishop of Rome. So, of course, he oversees the church in Rome. This is our first indication that we have a pope who's saying, but wait, I can also uh, talk about people in other parts of, the, of Christianity at this time, the Roman Empire. So, 96. Uh, right around 100, St. John dies. So, he was the youngest of the, uh, of the apostles. He was one of the few that lived. Was he the only one who was not martyred? He lived a natural life. And so... Uh, so when he died, of course, we no longer have the apostolic period. So if you look at a book and it says the subject heading, actually I have my wife here for this. She's good at subject headings. That's what she does. Uh, she applies subject headings to things. Like on me, it says Roush, comma, Dave, comma, irritating. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, since 1967. Uh, but uh, the apostolic period, if you get a book about the apostolic period, that is the earliest of the early church. Uh, Catholic was attached to the church by St. Ignatius of Antioch, writing some letters as he was being dragged off to prison and eventual uh, martyrdom in, in Rome. Uh, he called the church Catholic. Catholic is the Greek word for universal. It's all Greek to me, but Catholic is the Greek word for... Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the original language of the Catholic church was actually Greek. Uh, it wasn't later... Because Greek was seen as being sort of the hoity-toity, you know, if you're somebody you know Greek, only those, you know, dirty, man, use the term bastard on, I just did. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that, that Latin was actually considered the Vulgate. It was the vulgar language because, you know, the Greeks, uh, the Romans, even though they were stronger than the Greeks, uh, the Greeks, Dr. Brasington's going to kill me for my entire discussion right now, but, uh, which is fine, I don't care. Uh, he teaches history, I teach political science. So, uh, but uh, the, the Greeks, of course, were much more you know, elite. They were more educated. The Romans were just sort of dirty bastards that, that ran around and took over, the, took over the world. So Latin was considered the vulgar language. Uh, that, Latin eventually becomes the church language. But, uh, so but we, we see our first big heresy. Uh, the heresy about rebaptizing folks uh, actually comes up a little bit later. I'll talk about that, too. Uh, we have Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Have you ever heard the term knowledge? How do you go from gnosis, which is the Greek word for knowledge, so it filters through Latin, filters through German, and now you get knowledge with a K and an N. Uh, I always like uh, international students trying to learn, a, uh, trying to learn English. What, why is it knowledge? Why does, it start with, why does psychology start with a P? Uh, shouldn't it start with an S? Uh, <laughs> uh, spent hours on that one time when I should have been advising a student. Uh, <laughs> The heresy of Gnosticism, the Gnostics denied that uh, Jesus was human. Uh, the Gnostics also believed that there was like a, a spiritual key to understanding life. Uh, and once you achieve that spiritual key to understanding life, now most Christians would actually agree with that, and, and that you get that key when you die. Now the problem comes in when people might be encouraged to die to get the key. Uh, you've seen cults, uh, I don't know, it was one where all they ate was applesauce or something. Wasn't that the applesauce cult? Uh, I, Heaven's Gate, I think it is. And they, were, they all ate poison applesauce and died on punk beds in Southern California. There's so much in that message. Uh, bunk beds, Southern California, poison applesauce. It, it was the church for me. Uh, I hate bunk beds. Uh, I always get either on top, where I can't get up there because then I can't get back down, or B, I'm below the fat guy. <laughs> so I, I wake up in this, like a bulge, just sort of, uh, Boy Scout camp was pure joy when I was uh, growing up. Uh, until someone pointed out I was the fat guy for the guy below. Uh, actually, that was my brother, but that's... St. Irenaeus. Uh, St. Irenaeus was the Bishop of Lyon. 
in France. Uh, interesting enough, in the early church, there, there are two places. Uh, we always think of Rome kind of as like the, the, the hot, hotbed of knowledge, the hotbed of theological learning and things. In fact, it's not. North Africa is probably the most active uh, theological at this time because it was far enough away from Rome and there was a lot of barren emptiness in North Africa that the Christians could be far away from other people. So persecutions didn't matter as much because there was no one there to persecute you. Uh, so, uh, but then also uh, sort of the, the, southern, the northern part of the Mediterranean, southern France into Spain was also another hotbed of theological learning and that's Lyon. Uh, he was one of the, uh, St. Irenaeus challenged uh, Gnosticism and he said that the teaching and tradition of the church in Rome is the standard which all churches must follow. So he is an, again another one of those who said Rome, what the church in Rome, which meaning the bishop of Rome, says is what goes. Uh, so he was one of those. Um, we have another um, heresy, the Arian heresy, which is a Trinitarian heresy, but it's uh, really related to uh, you have God the Father who then creates Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is not, not, not kosher. Uh, well, it's not kosher. It's, it's Christian. Uh, but no, it's, a, it, and it, it's actually a pretty popular heresy. Uh, one of the fascinating things is to read about some of those, because uh, this heresy was, oh, uh, was challenged and condemned by the Council of Nicaea. So church councils, all the bishops, church leaders will come together in one central location. And in this case, it was Nicaea, which is a city on the, the Anatolian Peninsula where Turkey is now. Uh, and what's interesting about it is every bishop came with his entourage. And in many cases, bishops' entourages included numerous bodyguards. At the Council of Nicaea, there were just sessions of the Council of Nicaea where the bodyguards just beat the snot out of each other. Uh, you may have, you, what you want to do sometime is there's this great, uh, CNN did a great series on Vatican II, where they showed all the debates at Vatican II and stuff. Now imagine the debates at Vatican II, but with people with brass knuckles beating each other up. Uh, that was the Council of Nicaea. So, why do I like church council history so much? Because there's enough violence to keep you going for many days. Uh, so uh, Arius was a priest. Um, there's some stories that say that um, Attila the Hun, who was a barbarian, he was baptized, but he would only follow Arianism. And that caused uh, the Pope some heartburn. First of all, he's Attila the Hun. That caused a lot of heartburn. But he was also then, you know, I'm, well, I'm Christian, uh, so I'm Attila the Christian Hun, and, uh, but I'm Arian. So there were some, some concerns there. Uh, what else do we have? Arian and 312. Hey, we're already up to 312. Uh, how many decades do, oh, we still have quite a number of centuries to go, don't we? Uh, we have another heresy, Donatus. Donatus? It's all, it's like I said before, it's all Greek to me. Uh, but he was a bishop in North Africa, and he taught the heresy that the church consists only of the elect, and the only people that could baptize were people that followed him. Seems kind of self-serving, doesn't it? Okay, uh, the only people who can baptize other people, uh, and you have to be rebaptized. So he's one of those people, during a persecution, people left the church. They want to come back. Uh, one of the other books that I, I list on the alternative or the additional resources is uh, The Doors to the Sacred. And The Doors to the Sacred point out the history of all of the sacraments. Now, of course, all the sacraments are based in Scripture. But you'll never see, you know, okay, do we use a water hose? Do we use a bucket for baptism? There's nothing in the Bible that says what is used. Now, biblical baptism, where everyone goes in the water, they get dunked completely and get all wet. Uh, and I would always imagine the northern climes, when they started baptizing like the kings of Norway and stuff, that was a chilly event. Uh, and, you know, had I been a deacon up there, it would have been like, uh-uh. <laughs> You're not paying me enough. Uh, that water's cold. Uh, can we wait for spring? Uh, which, actually, in Norway, not much warmer, really. <laughs> uh, there's those two days in, in, at least when I lived in Alaska, those two days in August when it's actually reasonably warm. Uh, eh, not bad. But then it starts getting cold again. Uh, Donatus, of course, was, you know, rebaptized people. So uh, 
The Council of Carthage in 404 condemned Donatism and St. Augustine, or St. Augustine, you say tomato, I say tomato, uh, St. Augustine wrote against it. What's the city in Florida? So is it St. Augustine? Okay, but we say Augustine. Hmm. Uh, it's named after that saint. So <laughs> those, those. Well, we also say Miami. Miami, in, yeah. Uh, I grew up not too far from Lancaster, which everyone always says is Lancaster. And they're like, no, it's not Lancaster. It's <laughs> Lancaster. Uh, yeah, it does. Lancaster. Uh, and then we spent a summer in, uh, not a summer, but a couple weeks in England one time, and they don't pronounce half the letters in the names. You know, it, it looks like Leicester, but it's pronounced Lester. I'm like, what do you do with the extra E, the extra I? There's a couple R's in there that you didn't even think about. Uh, okay, 312 to 325. That's a, a notable time. Uh, there's a, uh, one of the, the people I watch on TV a lot. I watch a lot of TV. Uh, is Rick Steves. You're familiar with Rick Steves. He travels, has a travel show and stuff. And uh, I particularly like the episode where he's in Rome. And he shows all the stuff you can see in Rome, all the different things. But one, <laughs> one of the things he says, and I, 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 I think he was born a Methodist. It's hard to tell what he is now. Uh, notice I did the fingers again. Uh, but one of the things he said was, this was built by Constantine. You know, before Constantine, you were killed if you were a Christian. After Constantine, you were killed if you weren't a Christian. And they're like, huh, that's very simplistic, but not too far off the point. Uh, <laughs> so that happened. Constantine. Constantine takes Christianity from a persecuted religion to the official religion of Rome. Constantine, of course, was involved in a civil war that marked most of Roman history during that time. Civil war, some other general or somebody would pop up and, you know, I'm the emperor. No, I'm the emperor. And so they had to fight. So you get your army and his army. Well, before fighting uh, at a bridge, Meloton, Meloton, it's a bridge that starts with M, uh, Constantine saw an image of a cross. And he said that, that the cross told him to put this on, on your banners, put this on your, you know, your signs, all the, you know, the, the shields and stuff, and you will win. So he put this cross on everything, and he won. So he decided, hey, I'm going to become Christian. Now, of course, he didn't get baptized until right before he died. He's an emperor, not a dumb emperor. Emperors don't always do good things. Sometimes emperors have to do bad things. And so he decided that, you know, after I get baptized, I can't sin anymore. So how can I be a decent emperor? Uh, so he didn't, <laughs> well, I'm blowing everybody out of the water today, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> so uh, he was baptized right before he died. Most kings were baptized they may have had Christian leanings, but they weren't baptized until right before they died because, you know, that way they died in a state of grace. Uh, with Constantine, and, and we would go back to that history, Doors of the Sacred, that the history of penance really hadn't developed thoroughly yet by the time Constantine was around. So uh, he was still in, under the impression that once he sinned, he wasn't Christian anymore. There wasn't any way to get back in. Once you're out, you can't get back in. That's the development of, of penance. Uh, if you're ever in Germany, go to Rotenburg. Rotenburg has the most fascinating crime and punishment museum. Uh, now, if you're a criminal justice person, I, that's my department. I, I work with criminal justice folks. But it has all sorts of crime and punishment type of things. Let's say you're guilty of gluttony. It's a, it's a, a famine, and you're constantly eating. They weld you into a pig mask. So it's a metal mask. They put it on your head. That's your penance. You have to spend two years wearing this pig mask, if you live that long. Uh, but there's enough room where you can suck stuff, you can drink, uh, and I don't know, they didn't have, yeah, I didn't, they didn't have like the Ninja Blender back in the, you know, <laughs> 600s or 700s. Uh, and so that's uh, penance, the development of penance. What do you do for penance? Uh, early penances were things like, uh, if you sinned, you know, now if you sin, and the priest will say, 10 Hail Marys, and you know, tell your brother that he's not a, he's not a butthead. Uh, type of thing. Oops, I need to write that down. I need to do that. Uh, <laughs> telling your brother he's not. I didn't use the term butthead, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I used some other term. I said large butthead. Uh, so uh, he is. He's bigger than I am. The uh, penance. The, the early penances, 
Uh, and you'll, you'll get a, a hint of this, this in a couple of weeks. You would uh, have to wear like, like burlap bags. I don't know if you're familiar with feed bags. Burlap feed bags, kind of itchy. Have you ever, um, and they're really itchy. Uh, when we were little kids, my mom thought one year for Halloween it'd be kind of cool to dress my brother and I up like Indians, Native American Indians. This is the 70s. It was okay to do stuff like that then. Uh, no, it wasn't, but we didn't know better. Uh, so she went and got some of my, my dad's feedback. I grew up on a farm. He, she cut the feed bags, put them on. <laughs> it's like an itchy wool sweater uh, type of thing, except this was covered with feed. <laughs> and uh, uh, not doing that again. The, the, uh, but you'd also have to put ashes on your head. That was indicative of that the fact that you were, you know, you were penitent. Uh, and in many cases, you would have to stand at the church entrance and ask everyone, please pray for me, I'm a sinner. Please, please pray for me, I'm a sinner. Everyone who would go in. So uh, the history of penance is a fascinating subject to look at, how, how things have changed over time. Uh, that's, let me just take one step back to indulgence. Uh, we still have indulgences. Uh, like I said, when we go to the Stations of the Cross, when we pray Stations of the Cross, look at the little booklet. If you complete a Stations of a Cross, you get one plenary indulgence. Yay! Uh, if, you, uh, if you give me $300, you'll get 300 plenary indulgences. Wink, wink. Uh, ergo, the problem with indulgences. Uh, in the Middle Ages, they were sold as fundraisers. You're familiar with the little kid that comes by selling candy bars? Imagine the little bishop coming by, by selling indulgences. Uh, one of the other issues was, okay, the, the bishop wants to build a new cathedral. So we're just going to have a fundraiser by selling indulgences. Uh, essentially, the knights that would buy these indulgences, you had to be pretty wealthy to buy one. So there's another problem. Only wealthy people could get these indulgences, meaning they wouldn't have to spend time in purgatory. All the poor people would have to spend time in, pur in purgatory. Uh, how much time? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm expecting you know, at least 10,000 years myself, but uh, that's just my nature. Uh, my brother will spend 10,000 and what? Uh, <laughs> Nanny, nanny. Uh, so uh, uh, I talked about indulgences. It wasn't, indulgences were not the problem. It was the selling thereof. Uh, indulgences are as, as old, excuse me. <coughs> indulgences were as old as the church. That you can see evidence of early indulgences where you did stuff. Uh, if you made a pilgrimage to Rome, a pardon, pilgrimage to Jerusalem, first of all, that was dangerous because you might be picked off by robbers or beaten up by somebody or something. But if you made it, you would get indulgences. Uh, I, I get indulgences every time I serve as a function as a deacon. Yay! Uh, you would think with my record, I'd be there all the time. But <laughs> no, me, 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 me. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's one of my indulgences I need to get. Uh, not being so open about it. But, uh, let's see, run, run through a couple of things. Council of Nicaea. Nicene Creed, Arianism. Uh, the Roman Empire uh, officially names Christianity the, the official church in 381, which basically means if you uh, worship anything else, now you're not a, not a good person. Uh, it's interesting because the Roman government still liked, the Roman government had this interesting relationship with Jewish people because Jewish people actually existed. Judaism actually existed before Rome existed. And so Rome officially saw that as a good thing. It's older than Rome, we must like it. Uh, plus, uh, Jewish folks would do things like buy and sell stuff, set up banks, kind of the dirty business that uh, you, the Roman people didn't really want to do for themselves. So that's why the Romans let the Jews exist, as long as they didn't you know, get too uppity. Uh, you don't want uppity Jewish people. So, yeah, you didn't want uppity Jewish people. Uh, they'd be called uh, uh, zealots and they'd have a thing Masada and stuff. And, and so forth. Uh, St. Jerome, the patron saint of librarians, translates the Old Testament from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. So we start seeing Latin becoming much more important in the church because the church can write stuff now. It's not hiding anymore. So it can publicize itself. So it's got to publicize itself in Latin. And uh, St. Jerome did not like the translations he saw because they weren't proper, properly translated from Hebrew and Greek. Uh, so he actually took the Old Testament. He created the first version of the Bible, first official version called the Vulgate, because Latin was considered a vulgar language, vulgar of the people language. Uh, 
We get a whole lot of firsts here. Uh, Council of Ephesus, Mary's declared the mother of God, Theotokos. Uh, we have Patrick saving Christianity. Uh, Patrick and the Irish monks. Uh, Patrick was then rewarded by being sent back to Ireland. <laughs> what a reward. Uh, it rains a lot there. Uh, did they have whiskey at that time? I guess they must have at that point already. Uh, St. Benedict. St. Benedict was one of the first people to create a, a monastery. He got this idea. There were hermits up to this point. Desert, desert fathers, sometimes they're called. Hermits that would live out in the desert all by themselves. Uh, the problem was they were so popular out by themselves, they could never be by themselves. People would come out to visit them all the time. What is your wisdom? Well, my wisdom was <laughs> that I thought I was 13 miles away from everybody. Now I have to go another 45. Uh, and this is a long walk. Uh, these desert fathers, by the way, the hermits, were one of the first inventors of uh, the rosary. Uh, <laughs> uh, Father Tony, Tony Nash, always tells the funny story of how the first inventor of the, the rosary beads, uh, what they would do is they would, of course, pray the Psalms as, as a rosary. They wouldn't just do a rosary, they would pray the Psalms. And each time they say a Psalm, they would drop a little rock behind it. Well, the problem is you need to have an assistant to pick up the rocks behind you because then you'd have to go get more rocks. <laughs> uh, why don't we put the rocks on a string? Hey, there's an idea. Uh, and you just call it, you know, this isn't a rocks, and I don't know if I can get it out with all my other stuff in my pocket. That's a little kid thing that I've never outgrown, putting all sorts of stuff in my pocket. But my, my rosary, you put your rocks on a, on a string, then you don't have to drop them all the time. Uh, you don't have to have an assistant go around picking up all 50 of your rocks. Uh, Father Tony said, one uh, hermit tried marbles, but he kept losing his marble. <laughs> so he lost his marble. St. Benedict. Anyone not familiar with Monte Cassino? Monte Cassino? It's a high mountain named Casino, <laughs> Monte Casino. <laughs> right next to Monte Casino is Monty Python. Uh, no, 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 uh, you saw that one coming. Uh, Monte Casino, of course, is a high place that has a, uh, the Benedictine Monastery. It was bombed in World War II. Uh, it shows up in a couple of World War II movies that I, I watch regularly. Uh, Mark Clark, uh, but uh, St. Saint, Saint Benedict created, and he created a rule, the Benedictine rule, where here's how people live when they're in a monastery, when they're, they're monks. Uh, and then uh, every now and then people ask this question. Uh, the first pope to change his name was John II. You would think it would have been John I, but uh, I think John I was probably already named John when he was named pope. But uh, the first pope to change his name, it didn't, uh, this practice did not become a general activity, a general uh, feature of becoming a pope until 1099, 1099, 10, I cannot read, 1009, uh, 10, 1009, uh, Sergius, so he changed his name to Sergius. I think his name before, he was a slave, I remember, uh, he, I think it was actually Mercury was his name before, and you couldn't really have a Pope Mercury. There seems something, I don't know, bicultic about that, uh, where Okay, I'm the head of the Christians, but my name is a Greek god. Hmm, that's not going to work. Uh, so I need to change it to something impressive like Sergius. Uh, oh no, uh, see, uh, around 545, Dionysus Exeguus died. Woohoo! He was the one who came up with the idea of AD and BC. Uh, he was three years off. But since he wasn't using a, he was using a, an abacus and not a calculator, he was... Pretty, pretty close anyway. Uh, we have Gregory the Great. He was always walking around chanting. People say, I talk to myself when I walk. Uh, I should chant to myself. <laughs> don't step in that hole, don't, don't step in that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the time we get to 625, now we see the rise of Islam. And that's, again, another historical issue, incident. Uh, where uh, Muslims coming from the Middle East start taking over things like Jerusalem, places like Jerusalem, North Africa, uh, even all the way up to Spain. Spain was uh, controlled a, for a long time by, by Muslims. Uh, and there's a whole series of, of interesting, if you ever sp study Spanish history, uh, it's just fascinating how uh, the Muslims and the Jewish folks worked to get pretty well together, and Christians were allowed and stuff. But when uh, the Christian king and queen took over Spain, they uh, kind of required a lot of the Muslims to convert as well as the Jewish folks to convert. 
Uh, and so that's where you start getting like the inquisitions. Were you properly converted? Uh, boy, I can put a lot of history in a short sentence, can I? Uh, I'm mixing all sorts of concepts together here. Before we get to uh, 990, any questions? I think 990, the uh, 1814 to 990 has my point, uh, which is good because I'm running out of time. Uh, this is sometimes known as probably the darkest part of the Dark Ages. Why was it the Dark Ages? Well, because light bulbs had not been invented yet. And second, uh, it was largely because history had essentially not been remembered. Uh, what's fascinating is most of European history that we know, most of Roman history that we know, we get from Muslims. It's very interesting because a lot of uh, Muslim scholars translated Greek like Socrates and Plato, Aristotle. They translated into Muslim language, Islam. What's the language? Arabic. That would be good too. Arabic. Uh, <laughs> that works. It just wasn't working with the Muslim. And, the, uh, and so uh, it eventually uh, in Spain actually is where a lot of the uh, Arabic works that were history of Europe were translated back into Latin. Greek and Latin, so that people in Europe can learn about their history from the Muslims, which is kind of interesting to know. Uh, because they, the times weren't as dark um, in Muslim territory as it was in uh, European. It was also a time of corruption within the church. Uh, there was violence, ruthlessness, and chaos in Europe. One of the problems that you had, you know, this king over here would fight with this king on the other side of the mountain, uh, and all these Christian kings were fighting each other. And so... Uh, we'll see in a little bit, the way the Pope got around this was, let's give the Christian kings all a common enemy and maybe set up some sort of little travel log that they could do where they all get together and march to the Middle East and try to beat up some, some Muslims and get Jerusalem back. Uh, there have been many bad priests, bad bishops, and even a few bad popes. Uh, there's a fascinating book about the history of the Pope, the papacy, called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, the other day, I, I'm a political science professor. I, you probably already knew that and you don't care. Uh, yeah, I like it. It gets me coffee at different places. The, uh, so uh, I was reading about the impeachment and can we impeach a president after he's no longer being president? Did you know that they convicted a pope of being a heretic after he was dead? So they took the pope, they unpoped him, well, they dug him out. Uh, they tried him. The cadaver, it was the cadaver senate. Uh, so uh, you talk about good, bad, and ugly. So this is one pope who didn't like that previous pope. I want to say Pope Formosa. For some reason, that comes into mind somewhere. Uh, that, uh, so they convicted him, actually. And they, they beheaded him. They broke off his blessing fingers. So he couldn't do this anymore. They broke those off, buried them someplace, and dumped the rest of his body in the Tiber. Uh, that was sort of the ancient Roman way of getting rid of people, too. You don't bury people. You just throw them in the river. It's like the sewer. You, you flush the goldfish down the toilet. Uh, that's how you get rid... Didn't your dad ever flush her? So what happened after that? What did he get thrown in the, the sewer, the water? He floated away. <laughs> didn't they end up finding his body and some people were healed later? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he comes back. Uh, what's interesting then is another pope, I don't think it was the one right after the one who convicted him, but then rehabilitated the pope that had been convicted. I don't know if they tried to put his fingers back on. Uh, but uh, it, it's a, it, a good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, now, what's important is that last sentence. Uh, at times, popes appoint, appointed family members as cardinals, archbishops, and bishops. There is a lot of cardinals at this time who were like the nephews of the pope, which wouldn't be so bad, but they were only 16. So you take a 16-year-old, make him a cardinal. Well, I mean, he's probably not been properly trained on cardinal stuff, how to fly and things, but uh, he's not trained on cardinal stuff, so what's he going to do? Well, he ends up having a whole bunch of mistresses, etc. He's corrupt. He's trying to get money from people. He's a landowner. Uh, and uh, many of these were totally unsuited. But the reason why the Pope did that was so that the next time we have a conclave, when, when I die as Pope, now maybe my brother will be elected because his nephew is... You know, two or three of the, the cardinals picking the pope are nephews. They're related. So that's how we keep the pope in the family. Wouldn't it be great to have a family with a pope? Uh, <laughs> my, my mom always prayed for someone who'd work, uh, <laughs> much less a pope. But uh, so my mom's Lutheran. Anyway. Uh, however, 
During this turbulent time, not one false doctrine was proclaimed, nor was even one doctrine denied by any pope. So these popes were not the most pleasant people. They were ruthless. They would murder people. They themselves were murdered, uh, assassinated. But they never changed anything like you know, the church is based on scripture. They never changed that. Uh, even the worst, now part of it, you could argue, they didn't have time. They were too busy being ruthless and you know, murdering people and stuff. So they didn't have time to think about church type stuff, uh, which is a good thing because they didn't change anything. Uh, it's pretty much stayed, stayed the same. Uh, we'll just go through this uh, really quick. Uh, we uh, have more popes. We have a cardinal. We get uh, Fourth Lateran Council. Uh, there's a schism. Uh, which schism is this? This is a schism. At one time, there were three people who claimed to be pope. Who do you send your money to? Uh, let me flip all the way back to 1870. Probably 1870 is the best year that could ever happen to the Pope. At the time, the Pope did not think so. He actually locked himself into the Vatican. Pope, oh, good. Leo, I think it was. It was one of the Leos, Pope Leo uh, at the time. Uh, up until this point, the, uh, the Pope actually owned lands. It was called the Papal States. If you're a stamp collector, for example, you can collect stamps, Papal States. They're hard to get because they're kind of expensive since the Papal States ended in 1870. Uh, but the Papal States, he actually controlled these lands. He was the, sort of essentially the president, the governor. Uh, and one of the problems that he had was people didn't like him. One of the things he would do is regularly hire foreign folks to be like the police. So it wasn't like other Italians were policing the Italians. It was occasionally the French. Uh, every now and then he would get a few Germans from the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> it's funny. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. Discuss. Uh, that's, I mean, or an empire, for that matter. It was a collection, a loose confederation of, of uh, uh, kingdoms and so forth. But uh, in 1870, as I said before, Garibaldi, the nationalist, the Italian nationalist, took over the Italian peninsula and, be, and created what is now known as Italy, what we know as the Republic of Italy. And this really upset the Pope uh, so much that he locked himself into the, well, sorry, I was wrong, Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono, uh, was, the, uh, was the Pope, and he locked himself in. Every Pope after that refused to leave the Vatican until 1929. In 1929, Mussolini, you always think of Mussolini as a great guy, uh, he had a good haircut, but uh, Mussolini, the, uh, the uh, uh, Il Duce, the leader of, of Italy, signed an agreement with the Pope saying, okay, Pope, you have your own land. I want to say, is it 16 square acres, 16 acres in the middle of Rome? That's the Vatican. It's uh, 109. This oh. Here. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> I should probably read my own stuff. Uh, 109 acres. That's even bigger. Uh, 109 acres. Uh, Except for he has some extra, extra territorial type of things. He has a ra radio station, which is up in the hills. Uh, the, the Lateran uh, Castle, Lateran Palace. Uh, so he, the Pope now it does control land. He actually is the governor of land. 109 acres of it. Uh, but because he was no longer uh, uh, essentially a king, a prince type of person, he could focus purely on spiritual matters. And you'll notice the popes after 1870 focus a lot on the well-being of their people, which would be us. Uh, so that's, uh, that's probably the most important part. Uh, and then with the signing of the Lateran Treaty, gave some of that stuff back. Uh, we actually have diplomatic ties. Uh, I want to say, I can't remember which wife it was, but one of the wives of Newt Gingrich was the ambassador to the Holy See for a while. Notice I said one of the wives of uh, Newt Gingrich goes through wives pretty quickly. So. Well, I need to actually head over. Uh, if you have any questions, send them to Stephanie. Oh, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, look that up. Uh, there is a, a feature on the web. If you ever go and type on Google Saint of the Day, uh, it brings up the saint for that day. Uh, that's what we would do. I know uh, Deacon Gabe and I uh, would switch off on like Tuesdays and Wednesdays in uh, daily mass uh, with Father Fawn, and I, I would look up what, what feast day it was, and traditionally I would get the day that was a, the feast day of a tree or something, 
Uh, and so I'd have to talk about, this tree leaves only in spring. And, uh, I would never get any good, except for that one. <laughs> I had to do one one time on a father, a father, not a father, a doctor of the church. Early church father. There are 33 early church fathers. Pope Benedict wrote biographies of 32 of the early church fathers. Guess which feast day I had? The 33rd one, which is uh, St. Chrysologus, Chrysologus, golden tongue. Uh, that's what it means. Uh, and so I looked that up and tried to figure out why was he golden tongue? Because he was better at speaking than I am. Uh, <laughs> which, by the way, is a low bar to, to hit. Uh, why don't we, uh, I, and I apologize for dashing off so quick without giving you a chance to ask a whole lot of questions, but uh, let me close here with today's prayer after communion because I think it is very appropriate. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O God, who have willed that we be partakers in the one bread and the one chalice, grant us, we pray, so to live, that made one in Christ, we may joyfully bear fruit for the salvation of the world. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.